Welcome everybody to a meeting of the Boston Region Metropolitan Planning Organization. I'm David Muller and Secretary Jamie Tesler here. All participants will join the meeting with muted microphones. Please rename yourself to include your first name, last name, and affiliation. Please do not unmute or mute yourself. To participate in the discussion, please select the raise hand function. Find this by clicking either on the participants button at the bottom of the screen, and a window will pop up with a raise hand button at the bottom, or the reactions button in the toolbar. The chair will then call on participants. If you are on the phone, you can use star nine to raise your hand. If you have any technical difficulties, please contact Regine Foley via the chat box or at rfolei at ctps.org or call her at 857-702-3704. This meeting is accessible to people with disabilities. Zoom products are compliant with exceptions with the following standards. Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.1 Level AA Standards and Revised Section 508 Standards. If you require any additional accommodations in order to participate fully in this meeting, please contact Regine Foley of the MPO staff at rfolei at ctps.org or at 857-702-3704. John, please call the roll. Mass DOT Chair. David Muller, I'm here. Mass DOT C2. Uh, John Bouchard, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Mass DOT Highway Division. Okay. Uh, MBTA. Jillian Linnell, representing General Manager Steve Poftek. Thank you. Uh, Mass Port Authority. Sarah Lee is here. Thank you. Um, MAPC. Uh, good morning, Eric Barassa here. Thank you. Uh, MBTA Advisory Board. Good morning, Amira Patterson for the MBTA Advisory Board. Uh, Regional Transportation Advisory Council. Leonard Diggins wow. Advisory Council here. Thank you. City of Boston, BTD. Okay, City of Boston, BPDA. Uh, hi, Jim Fitzgerald, BPDA, representing Mayor Wu in City of Boston. Thank you. Um, at large, City of Everett. Okay, uh, at large, City of Newton. David Kozis, representing Mayor Ruth Ann Fuller in the city of Newton. Thank you. Uh, at large, town of Arlington. Gina Lamstutz, representing Select Board Chair Steve DeCourcy, town of Arlington. Thank you. Uh, at large, town of Brookline. Heather Hamilton for the town of Brookline. Uh, Intercore Committee, city of Somerville. Yeah, good morning, Tom Bent, uh, City of Somerville, representing Mayor Joe Curtatoni in the Inner Core. Thank you. Um, Minuteman Advisory Group on Interlocal Coordination, Town of Acton. Okay, uh, Metro West Regional Collaborative, City of Framingham. Uh, can someone unmute uh, Erica? Thank you. Erica Oliver Jerem, representing Mayor Spicer uh, on behalf of the Metro West Growth uh, Regional Collaborative. Thank you. Uh, North Shore Task Force, City of Beverly. Arlene Wynn, uh, representing City of Beverly and the North Shore Task Force. Thank you. Uh, North Suburban Planning Council, Town of Burlington. Melissa Kentakos representing NSPC and Jim Tigas. Thanks. Great. Uh, South Shore Coalition, Town of Rockland. Uh, Southwest Advisory Planning Committee, Town of Medway. Okay, and uh, Three Rivers and a Local Council, Town of Norwood, Neponset River Regional Chamber. 
Good morning, Tom O'Rourke from the town of Norwood, representing the TRIC subreach. Thank you. And our ex officio members, Federal Highway Administration. Good morning, Ken Miller, Federal Highway. Thank you. And Federal Transit Administration. Uh, that calls the roll, Mr. Chair. Thank you, John. Any claim on the agenda is the chair's report. I don't have one today, so we'll go directly into the executive director's report. Tegan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, welcome everyone to the last MPO meeting in 2021. Um, I just have to call it right off the bat, Len, I really enjoy your um, new Zoom photo. It's very festive and it makes me very happy. So thank you for the smiles. Um, and then also maybe for another smile, I should mention that we're not going to meet again until January 20th because we will be um, canceling the January 6th meeting. So last one in 2021 and you have about a month until the next one. Um, so just to start off my report, I wanted to thank everybody, um, the board members who participated in the focus group that we held two weeks ago, right after the last MPO meeting. Um, and that was the focus group that was about the scenario planning for the long range transportation plan process. Um, it was a great conversation. Um, I wasn't there, but I was able to actually watch afterwards and um, look at some notes. And so I really appreciate all the thoughtful discussion that you brought um, and that um, say that it was very helpful and informative for us. So we are also looking forward to more input from all of you uh, board members. Earlier this week, Michelle Scott sent out a survey um, and that survey asks the same um, questions or covers the same topics that we discussed in the focus group. And those are things like what you think might be long in a scenario planning process for Destination 2050, which is the long range plan that we're now working on developing and your input on the forces that you think um, will affect the future um, of transportation in the region. So please, if you haven't filled this out, um, do fill it out. We will send out a reminder email after this meeting um, and the close date for the survey is December 20th. And please contact Michelle Scott again, if you have any questions about it. Um, I have a number of staff updates today, um, which are very exciting. Um, first, I had mentioned at the last meeting that I would have more information about our new manager that would be leading our outreach and communications efforts. Um, his name is Sean Rourke, and he'll be taking on his new role on January 3rd. Um, he's coming to us from a, his current position where he is a director of operations and communications um, at the Alliance for Business Partnerships. So we're very much looking forward to him bringing the depth of his communication skills and expertise. Um, to us in the coming new year. And we actually already were able to very quickly bring on board our successful candidate for the public outreach coordinator. And she'll be working with Sean, under Sean, with Roisin Foley, just to remind you our communications associate, who you always see at these meetings here. Um, her name is Stella Jordan. She started with us this past Monday. So um, she comes to us with a master's degree in public policy from Northeastern University and has a background in and interest in justice systems and social and environmental equity. And since she did start this week, we're able to ask her to say a quick hello so that you can see her face and hear her voice. And of course, you'll be hearing much more from her in the future. Um, Stella, if you are able, do you mind saying hello? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you for the introduction, Tegan. Um, uh, as Tegan said, my name is Stella Jordan. Um, I am filling in the new um, public outreach coordinator role. Um, I'm really excited to step into this um, and to start working with you all more in the new year. Um, I am really interested in uh, getting involved with all of this work, um, especially the public participation side of things. Um, so really looking forward to working with everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Stella. And welcome, Stella. And please, if you have a chance to um, say hello to her as well and get to know her. Um, we have a few other recruitments that are still ongoing. We have finished second round interviews and hope to provide you more news soon about two positions. One is a um, new transportation planner slash data analyst position. And the other is the transportation planner who will also serve as the new UPWP manager position as Sandy moves on to other roles in the agency. So those we will hopefully announce relatively soon. And then we have an active job posting now um, that we're still recruiting for, which is the manager of projects and applications that would work under um, Rebecca Morgan. Please, please, please send good people our way. We are very excited to, um, to look at some good candidates for this position. Um, there is one more position open right now. Um, as I shared with board members in an earlier email, uh, Matt Genova, our Transportation Improvement Program, or TIP, 
manager for the past three years. We'll be departing the Boston area in the summer of 22, uh, moving south to Atlanta. So we will very much miss him, but we are also lucky to continue to have his expertise and energy on our staff for a bit while, a little bit longer. And so um, yesterday we posted the transportation planner and tip manager position who would um, replace his role and the applications will be, um, we'll be receiving applications until the 26th of January. So again, please send good people our way and we are very fortunate to have some time we hope to overlap um, with Matt for this new, um, new person filling this role can overlap with Matt and learn from him. And um, while we aren't saying goodbye yet, since I'm announcing it at this meeting, I'd just like to take a moment to celebrate Matt's contributions in the last three years. As I hope you've all uh, been keenly aware of, he's made great strides in building the relationships with all of you, as well as with um, municipal stakeholders and others that are engaging in the TIP process. Um, and part of that has been he's worked hard with his team to improve the materials that we present on the TIP. Um, and those are the materials that help you make uh, meaningful decision, decisions about the TIP and also help make it more transparent to the public. And then finally, I wanna emphasize that he really led and shepherded that effort to develop new criteria, new TIP criteria for how you select your projects. So he's done a lot in the last three years and I'm glad we'll have some time um, to enjoy his um, expertise for a while longer. But um, I'm sure some of you will wanna reach out and, and say um, hello and goodbye and, and wish him well as the months pass. So um, those are our staffing updates. Um, we have a few other um, outreach highlights. One is that the Transit Working Group has another um, set of upcoming events. There will be a coffee chat. Um, these are the smaller conversations. Um, this will be about human services transportation on Tuesday, January 11th at 4 p.m. And then the working group will also hold its quarterly meeting, that's kind of larger meeting um, in February. And we'll send more information about that soon, as long as um, about a forum that we are planning, um, focusing on microtransit. Um, and we are planning that in partnership with MEPC and the MBTA advisory board. And again, more information to come. Those future events are typically listed on our Transit Working Group web page. Um, and I think a link will get dropped into the chat for that. And if you aren't on the Transit Working Group email list and want to be, please do reach out to Sandy Johnston on our staff. Um, in addition, um, the website, the MPO website has for the first time a page fully dedicated to the freight planning program. Um, it just became live yesterday. And so it's pretty, um, pretty simple right now, pretty bare bones, but it's a really great place to get a sense of um, what the program is and see all of the products from that program in one place. So we're looking forward to making it more robust in the future. And um, please feel free to co contact Sandy um, with any questions about that program as well. And we'll put a link to the page in the chat as well if it's not there already. And then another reminder that the Community Connections Program applications are due tomorrow, December 17th. Um, there's links on um, the webpage on our, on our website to both guidance on the program and budget forms, as well as the applications for each program project type. So if you haven't applied or want to, please, please go there now and um, apply um, soon. Um, finally, our fall sub-regional outreach has wrapped up. Um, we had the, our last meeting um, with MAPC earlier this week with the more suburban planning council. And um, the information we received from all of those meetings are going to be used to inform the long range transportation plan uh, needs assessment. And so that's gonna serve as a tool for how um, we, we plan our future transportation network and prioritize funding that you allocate towards transportation projects. So thank you for your participation in those sub-regional outreach meetings and we'll continue on with our long range transportation plan um, outreach in the coming months. And then today, um, I wanted to just highlight that we have a few um, action items. We have, first of all, a work scope that's for the MBTA's DIDB policy um, update. And then we also have a vote today for you to release for public comment the first amendment to the federal fiscal year 22 to 26 tip. And then we'll also have a presentation um, related to that aforementioned freight program uh, by Bill Kuttner on hazardous cargoes on core area roadways. And then lastly, before I wrap up, just to highlight what might be coming on the 20th of January, we'll have a number of action items, likely three work scopes, um, future of the curve phase three, trip generation, and MBTA mobility integration. So those should be interesting, um, as well as a vote to endorse that amendment to the tip that I just mentioned. And then we also expect to have a presentation on the central business district phase two project. And January is also the month that we said we touch base on the future of MPO meeting formats. Um, with that, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Tegan. Any questions from the members for Tegan? 
Seeing and hearing none, the next item on our agenda is public comments. Is there anyone from the public who would like to comment at this time? Seeing none, if you would like to comment during the meeting, please raise your hand and we will call on you. Committee chairs reports, are there any? Nope. Next up, Regional Transportation Advisory Council report. Lynn? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to um, uh, Tegan for the, the shout out. And I think she realizes that it, elves like me, who are sometimes considered bad, we're not bad, we're just sometimes misunderstood. So we're doing our best, we're still doing our best. And, and to that end, and I want to report that we had an excellent um, meeting uh, last week um, with Colette Frank and, and Megan Jopp. You know, Colette is a select board member from Wellesley, you know, and Megan Jopp is the um, the executive to, uh, there. And um, uh, we, they talked about uh, regional trans uh, regional transit agencies meeting their 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 experience um, with their regional transit agency. And and I will urge anyone who's interested, you know, in that issue, we need to check out the beginning of the recording of our meeting because uh, because Kelly just did a great presentation and she really laid out their experiences and and some ideas about um, what we could maybe do and to help I me mean, not only the RTA uh, in her in her area, but also um, RTAs around around the state. Uh, and um, uh, we're going, we're actually going to continue focusing on on that too. And so I've I've asked a one of our members to uh, kind of take charge of that. But we're going to we're, this is not going to be the last time the um, advisory council is going to um, look at that issue. I mean, um, it, let me rephrase that and say that we're going to be looking at that issue a lot more in the upcoming year. Uh, and we had um, Bill Kuttner um, come um, to talk with us. So I'm not going to wax sentimental um, at this meeting because we've already done that. Uh, uh, and and, um, and lastly, um, uh, one other thing we want to continue um, doing, or maybe I should rephrase, rephrase it and say start doing, is is exploring some, um, some more big ideas. I know the MPO is doing that, but, but we want to... Um, not simply do scenario planning in, in the advisory council, but start thinking about really big ideas that are potentially transformational. More as an exercise to, to then try to boil that down to things that could be reasonably done you know, in the next 20 or so years as we look at the next LRTP. So that's it, thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Any questions from the members for Lynn? Seeing none, next item on the agenda is the approval of the MPO minutes from November 4th. Can I get a motion in a second to put them on the table and please state your name for the record. Eric Barassa. Good morning, Eric Barassa with MAPC. I make a motion to approve the November 4th uh, MPO meeting minutes. Thank you. Daniel Amstutz. I will second the motion. Thank you. Motion has been made and seconded. Are there any comments, changes, questions, or suggestions? See, well, Heather and Heather, do you have a question or are you just raising your hand in anticipation of voting? Anticipation of voting. My apologies. No worries. All right. Please, uh, no questions having been raised, please call the roll. David Muller. Yes. John Bouchard. John Bouchard, yes. John Romano. John Romano, yes. Thank you. He arrived later. Uh, Jillian Linnell. Jillian Linnell, yes. Sarah Lee. Sarah Lee, yes. Eric Barassa. Eric Barassa, yes. Amira Patterson. Okay, we'll come back. Uh, Leonard Diggins. Leonard Diggins, yes. Uh, Jim Fitzgerald. Jim Fitzgerald, yes. Uh, David Kozis. David Kozis, yes. Daniel Amstutz. Daniel Amstutz, yes. Heather Hamilton. Heather Hamilton, yes. Tom Bent. Tom Bent, yes. Erica Jerem. Erica Jerem, yes. Darlene Wynn. 
Charlene Wynn votes yes. Melissa Tintakalis? Melissa votes yes. And Tom O'Rourke? Yes. Okay, I'll just go quickly back to Amira Patterson. Amira Patterson, yes. Thank you. I'll call the roll. Uh, motion carries, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jonathan. Next item on the agenda is an action item for a work scope for the MBTA's DIDB policy update. Paul Christner. Mr. Chair, sorry, I'm just getting unmuted. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Paul Christner, I'm the manager of transit analysis and planning at CTPS, and I'm here to present a work program called MBTA DIDB policy update support. Uh, the proposed motion is for the MBT. MPO board, please vote to approve this work program. The client is the MBTA. Project principal is Rebecca Morgan, and I will serve as the project manager. Funding source, mascot directed PL funds. Schedule is six months from the notice to proceed, and the budget is just over $83,000. Study is supported in full with non MPO funding. Committing MPO staff to this project will not impinge on the quality or timeliness of MPO funded work. The MBTA's current disparate impact, disproportionate burden, or DIDB policy was issued on January 17th, uh, January 30th, 2017. Policy complies with the guidelines and requirements defined in the Federal Transit Administration's Title VI Circular 4702.1b, which requires transit providers to evaluate the equity of the impacts of proposed fare changes and major service changes. The FTA is in the process of updating its Title VI Circular. The MBTA also plans to update its current DIDB policy to better evaluate the equity, the impacts of fare changes and major service changes. The updated policy will be based on new FTA guidance, input from peer transit agencies, and the MBTA's experience with implementing the current policy since 2017. The MBTA has asked CTPS to support the goal of developing an updated DIDB policy, which is the objective of this work program. The work program is divided into three tasks. Task one is to identify strengths and weaknesses of the MBTA's current DIDB policy. CTVS will conduct a review of the MBTA's current policy to identify key strengths and weaknesses. Staff will also conduct seven to 10 interviews of MBTA staff and relevant local stakeholders. Product of task one is a memorandum describing the findings. Task two is a review of peer agencies' DIDB policies. CTVS will research at least five peer transit agencies' policies. This work will be done by conducting interviews with similar transit agencies in the United States and by conducting a literature review of relevant documents, including the written DIDB policies of peer transit agencies. Product of task two is a memorandum describing these findings. Task three is to support the update of the MBTA's DIDB policy based on the results of task one and two and in consideration of new FTA guidance. CTVS will provide options for updated metrics, suggested language, and thresholds to be reviewed by the MBTA and potentially included in an updated DIDB policy. Product of task three is a memorandum that includes the items I've just described. That concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Paul. Any questions from the members for Paul? Leonard Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, uh, this is great, Paul. I mean, uh, uh, I'm glad to see uh, the MBTA doing this. And again, I, mean, I, I am pretty sure that we participated in the last iteration of this back in 2017. I kind of recall it's taking place at Northeastern. And so, so I'll be happy to work with the MBTA to um, um, answer the questions that they potentially um, may ask as delineated in um, your work plan. Uh, and I'll also suggest that you know, when thinking about um, our current policies, uh, policies you know, that understanding how we came up with this policy could be helpful. You know, and so there might, it might be worthwhile to review you know, what happened um, back in 2016, 2017, as we were um, um, creating this current DB or DIDB policy. And, um, and one quick curiosity question that I just can't resist. What is the um, MASS.PL? funds um is funded by by that it's like um mass stock directed pl funds right so there are planning transit planning funds that come to the region that are divided between mapc ctps or the mapc the boston mpo and mass dot 
and MassDOT typically takes the MassDOT share and spends it on transit projects that are done by the CTPS staff. So this is a, coming out of MassDOT share of those formula funds. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. No worries, Lynn. Sarah Lee. Hi, thanks uh, for taking my question. Um, there was some discussion, I believe, in one of the news agencies this week, uh, I believe talking about this specific uh, policy and how it may uh, prevent um, Boston's fare free uh, bus uh, project. I'm just wondering if, if this is being done to address that issue or dig in further to that issue. Let me take this one, Paul. Sure. So, so that this that that article, it's not about the policy. It's about the fact that in order to run a pilot program, you can only have a pilot program for a set period of time. And the current proposal extends the, the fare free beyond what FTA would consider a pilot and would make it a permanent in FTA's mind service that would then trigger an analysis under the DIDV policy. We don't do an analysis of the equity implications of pilots because they're just pilots and we're testing things. But once you get to a certain point in time for FTA purposes, you've extended beyond a pilot and you're now got a permanent service and you have to do an equity analysis. And again, everybody believes the equity analysis of, of fare free um, service on those routes would be fine, it, but it, it, is, it is just one of the issues around fare free and, and, and how to implement that. So just to clarify, so the obstacle um, is basically a, a federal issue and would not be addressed through this process. Yes, the obstacle, the particular obstacle is, is the federal requirement that, that pilots can only extend for six months. Okay, thanks for clarifying. You're welcome. Other questions? Seeing none, can I get a motion in a second to approve as presented today and please state your name for the record. Lynn Diggins. Leonard Diggins, Southern Advisory Council, um, happily makes a motion to approve this work plan. Thank you, Eric Barasa. Uh, Eric Barasa, MAPC, I second that motion. Motion has been made and seconded. John, please call the roll. David Moeller. Yes. John Bouchard. John Bouchard, yes. John Romano. John Romano, yes. Jillian Linnell. Yes. Sarah Lee. Sarah Lee, yes. Eric Barasa? Eric Barasa, yes. Leonard Diggins? I'm sorry, Amira Patterson. Amira Patterson, yes. Leonard Diggins. <laughs> Leonard Diggins, yes. Uh, Jim Fitzgerald. Jim Fitzgerald, yes. Uh, David Kozis? David Kozis, yes. Daniel Amstutz. Daniel Amstutz, yes. Heather Hamilton. Heather Hamilton, yes. Tom Bent. Tom Bent, yes. Erica Jerem. Erica Jerem, yes. Darlene Wynn. Darlene Wynn, yes. Melissa Tintakalis. Melissa Tintakalis, yes. And Tom O'Rourke. Tom O'Rourke, yes. Motion carries, Mr. Chair. Thank you, John. Next item on the agenda is an action item for approval of Amendment 1 to the FFY 22 to 26 tip. Matt Genova. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, everyone. Uh, before I dive in, I'll also take a moment to say uh, Thank you to Tegan for her kind words at the start of today's meeting. I really appreciate those. Uh, and thank you to all of you who have reached out to, to say congratulations. Um, I really appreciate that as well. Um, obviously, I'm still, still around, so looking forward to continuing to work with you all in the coming weeks and months, um, but just wanted to use this as an opportunity to, to thank you. Um, so diving into Amendment 1, that's what I'm here to talk about today. This is Amendment 1 to the Federal Fiscal Years 2022 through 26 TIP, which is the current TIP uh, that is active today. Good. 
I apologize, running a little slow here. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that, having a, a lag on my end here. Um, so amendment one involves changes to both the highway and transit sections of the TIP, the full details of which are available in a handout that's posted to the MPO meeting calendar for your review. This is the first amendment to the current TIP, which was endorsed by this board on June 3rd, 2021, and which formally went into effect on October 1st of this year. On the highway side of things, this amendment proposes the addition of three line items to the statewide highway component of the TIP, and on the transit side, the MBTA is proposing program-wide adjustments to reflect current funding levels across programs and project readiness. So I'll start with the highway changes. Um, in those changes, MassDOT is proposing the addition of two new projects to the statewide highway program using funds from the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act, or CRISA. These funds were dispersed to states from Congress as a part of the aid bill passed in December of 2020. The proposed projects to be added include the uh, replacing the HOV barriers on the Southeast Expressway in Boston, Milton, and Quincy at a cost of $32,200,000. Uh, projects, the other project proposed to be included here uh, is the construction of a, an office and salt sheds and the reconstruction of the park and ride lot along Route 9 in Framingham at a cost of $3.45 million. In addition to those two projects, Amendment 1 proposes the programming of slightly less than $25 million in CRISA funds to cover operating costs for the Metropolitan Highway System in the Boston region. Moving now to the transit portion of the proposed amendment, Amendment 1 also includes changes across the MBTA's federal capital program. As a standard practice in most years, this amendment proposes updates to the funding levels across the MBTA's programs in order to align those programs with the T's anticipated obligations. These obligations are based on a current assessment of project readiness. Most of the changes are proposed in federal fiscal year 2022, the first year of the active TIP, um, as the amendment includes the reprogramming of carryover funds that were unobligated in fiscal 2021. Of particular interest to this board, many of the MBTA administered projects funded through the MPO's Community Connections Program have formally been added to the MBTA's capital program uh, through this amendment. Uh, those projects include carryover funds from 2021 uh, for the transit signal priority projects in Cambridge and Somerville, uh, and projects funded in fiscal 2022, including whale fi wayfinding at Alewife, transit signal priority on Main Street in Everett, and new bike racks across a number of MBTA stations system-wide. Again, all those projects were funded through the MPO's Community Connections Program, and so those funds are uh, now formally being flexed from the highway side of things where the MPO's funding sits to the transit side of things uh, to fund those projects through the MBTA. Additional new projects include the MP MPO-funded second phase of the Columbus Avenue bus lanes and the Blue Hill Avenue corridor project, which was recently awarded a $15 million raise grant. Also flagged that not yet included in this amendment are any new funds that may become available as a result of the bipartisan infrastructure law. As we discussed at a prior MPO meeting, more details on this new legislation will become available after the first of the year with programmatic changes following from there through future amendments. And as is customary, uh, the MBTA will continue to evaluate program sizing for fiscal years 2023 and beyond as a part of the forthcoming TIP development process this coming spring. So that's why this amendment really focuses in on adjustments to the T's 2022 program, uh, as those are projects and programs that need to move forward in the current fiscal year. So with your vote today, Amendment 1 will be released for a 21-day public review period. The public review period will begin in the coming days and will conclude in advance of the January 20th MPO meeting. At that meeting, MPO staff will review any comments submitted on the amendment and then request your final vote on the amendment's endorsement. That's all I have on Amendment 1, and so I'll turn it back over to the chair for questions and a vote. Thank you, Matt. Questions from the members? Lynn Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, so this is more of a, a process question. I mean, so, so the highway projects that are selected, would those have been projects that 
would have gone you know, into the, the um, tip universe or been put in, into the, um, the five-year tip plan? I, I don't understand your question, I guess. Um, so, so the, so let's say the, um, mm -hmm. can you scroll back, Matt, to um, the, the highway? So let's say the, the, um, the Southeast Expressway um, barriers, uh, would that have gone on to the, the, the tip at some point if, they, if it wasn't being put into the... Um... So w w let me try to answer your question. I think, what, I think I have an answer. So these projects are federal aid eligible. They're ready to go. We could have come absent the CRISA funding because we are going on to the tip just in a minute. But absent right. the funding, we could have come to the MPO and I and asked you to program them other with, either with other mass dot controlled federal funding or with MP, MPO funding. Um, we did not choose to do that in the development of the last tip, but now that we've got Chris money, we're, we want to spend it on these two projects. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry, sir. Go ahead. Okay. I think that answers your question. But, you know, yeah. More. Yeah, it does. And so what I'm, I'm leading at is, and, and I'm, I'm fine with this. I mean, these are good projects. But I'm just trying to assist more process oriented. I mean, so, so if they had been I mean, gone through the regular process, they would have, they would have been scored. You know? And I guess what I'm trying to get at is, is, is what is the basis um, for choosing these versus others? I mean, is it really a matter of readiness and cost with respect to the funds that are available or right. some other? So the MPO only scores target projects, okay? okay? So we have a whole host of things that mass dot funds with federal aid that the MPO doesn't score, right? Okay. We, bring, we bring you a bridge list and ask you to agree to fund it. You always have, a, have a, a, a veto authority of not including something in the TIP, but you don't actually independently score projects that mass dot funds with mass dot controlled revenues. Gotcha. We, we probably would never have brought, these probably would not in our estimation have risen to the level that the MPO would use its own limited target funds for them. So we probably yeah. would have brought them to you to be scored as target candidates. Gotcha. Thank you for explaining that. I appreciate it. No worries, Lynn. Uh, Daniel? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just curious on just slightly more detail about the two um, the high occupancy vehicle lane barriers and then the operating costs. Um, I'm just curious, like I haven't been on the Southeast Expressway in a long time. Is that project just replacing the barriers themselves or, or is it, or also that machine that actually like moves them from one side of the, so I guess one side of the road to the other. And, and then for the, it says the Metropolitan Highway System operating costs. Can you just, well, what is that exactly? Yeah, so I'll answer the second question and then I'll ask John, I'll try to answer the first question, but ask John Bouchard to jump in because I'm well, actually I'll just let John answer the second question because I'm not sure. For the first so on your second question of the use of CRISA funds for Metropolitan Highway System operating costs. So everybody's gonna have to stay with me as I try to explain this. CRISA funds are eligible for both capital and operating. They are capital funds, so they have to be programmed in the tip, but they are eligible for operating expenses. What we're doing here is we're taking roughly $25 million of CRISA funds, funding MHS operating costs. That will free up $25 million of MHS funds that would otherwise be used for operating. We will then apply those funds to a capital project. That capital project is the reconstruction of the I-90, I-95 interchange in Newton and Weston. We have been working on that project and designing it as a non-federal aid project. We did not want at this late date to try to federalize it by using CRISA capital funds for it. So we're using the CRISA capital funds for the MHS operating costs and then freeing up the MHS operating costs to help fund the capital project. And okay. you got any, any more questions on that before I let John answer the question about whether the barriers are just barriers or the barriers in the machine? Oh, I guess I guess I was, <laughs> thank you for that extra. I think I was just asking like, what are, MHS operating right, like so costs, like what do they, what do you use them for? MHS operating costs are the costs um, to, to operate the MHS system. It's all the back office costs, mm. right? We don't have toll takers anymore, but it's all the back office costs and the accounting costs and all of those things that, that, that it costs to run the system 
even though we don't have toll, toll takers anymore. Okay, I see, thank you. You're welcome. John Bouchard, can you answer the question, is the uh, HOV project just the barrier replacement or is it barriers plus machine? Uh, no, it's it's barrier it's barrier replacement only, and it's uh, it's definitely a safety upgrade uh, project that we have been looking at options to, uh, and that's why last last year uh, over the last two years we put out the bridge deck work in advance so that we could, we could get ahead of it. Thank you, John. Okay, thanks very much, Eric Barasa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a question about the the CRISA funds. These 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 were like part of the um, one of those like relief recovery packages that Congress passed um, like over a year ago, right? Yep. And uh, how much did we get as a state? I'm just curious. Do you, do you know that? We got 151 million dollars. 151. And you said that can be used for both operating and capital. And was that for for just MassDOT, or the, or did some of that go to the T as well? So that's just the mass dot share. Okay. And that was by like formula, right? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how they decided it. Mass dot got okay. it. There was some crystal formula that, that, that allocated the money. Yes. And will all that be programmed now, or will some will we see more of that over the course of the next um, year? Does right. That so, so we have not yet programmed the entire $151 million amount. Um, so there, there will be more programming across the Commonwealth in the future, some of which will probably be in this region as we develop additional projects. Okay, thank you. I, I appreciate the context. No worries. Ken Miller. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, just uh, uh, one point of clarification. Yes, the, the CRISA funds uh, uh, are separate from the ARPA funds. So, you know, the legislature and the governor of the legislature just approved, I guess, a $4 billion plan or whatever it is to spend some ARPA funds. There are other eligibilities for the ARPA funds in terms of transportation. I'm not, I don't know enough about it to know if the state is bailing themselves of, of, of any of those eligibilities. But these CRISA funds, uh, as David mentioned, are solely for, for transportation, they are federal highway funds. Uh, they do have eligibilities that for operating that normal federal highway funding uh, does not have. Uh, so the state is taking advantage of, uh, as David mentioned, uh, of those at that to, uh, in effect, fund that and uh, uh, some capital costs. Um, the other thing I did want to mention, I was going to wait for member items, but uh, yesterday, uh, Federal Highway did release uh, three memoranda uh, uh, which included the apportionments, uh, federal apportionments for uh, for 2022, uh, and also uh, the announcement of the obligation uh, authority limitation for 2022. I should note that uh, we just got the uh, we just transmitted them to MassDOT. Uh, we have to sort of uh, work with them to talk about what it all means. Uh, we are under a continuing resolution still until February 18th. So only, even though we have the full apportionments are available, only 31% of last year's obligational authority is the amount of obligational authority that is now available. Uh, but this, there are a lot of changes. And also there are two new programs, the, the formula, the bridge program, uh, and another formula program. Those are not eligible for fun, to be funded. Uh, projects are not eligible to be funded under those programs yet because they are new programs and we are still under a continuing resolution. So you're not allowed to fund new programs through a continuing resolution. It's, it's complicated. Uh, so we will be discussing uh, uh, what this all means with mass data and then how, what it all means in terms of for the MPOs and target funding and that kind of stuff. So I would say uh, stay tuned. I just want to let folks know that the notices did come out yesterday. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Seeing none, can we get a motion in a second to release this for a 21 day review period? And please state your name for the record and making the motion. Eric Barasa. Uh, yes, I'll make a motion to release this tip amendment for public review. Lynn Diggins. Uh, Lynn Diggins, advisor council seconds. Thank you, motion haven't been made and seconded. Jonathan, please call the roll. David Muller. Yes. John Bouchard. John Bouchard, yes. John Romano. 
John Romano, yes. Jillian Linnell? Jillian Linnell, yes. Sarah Lee? Sarah Lee, yes. Eric Barassa? Eric Barassa, yes. Amira Patterson? Amira Patterson, yes. Leonard Diggins? Leonard Diggins, yes. Jim Fitzgerald? Jim Fitzgerald, yes. David Kozis? David Kozis, yes. Daniel Amstutz? Daniel Amstutz, yes. Heather Hamilton? Heather Hamilton, yes. Tom Ben? Tom Ben, yes. Erica Jerem? Erica Jerem, yes. Darlene Wynn. Darlene Wynn votes yes. Melissa Tentaculus. Melissa T, yes. And Tom O'Rourke. Tom O'Rourke, yes. Motion carries, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is Hazardous cargoes on core area roadways. A presentation by Bill Kuttner. Whenever you're ready, Bill. Okay. Can everyone hear me? We can hear you and see you. Oh. Okay. And let me, yes. Uh, my name is uh, Bill Kuttner. I'm a senior analyst at the Boston Region MPO. And for the last few years, I have been uh, devoting uh, considerable attention to looking at uh, freight issues, uh, a great variety of freight issues. I have always been aware of the importance of hazardous cargoes, but this is the first time, uh, and they get mentioned in the other reports, but this is the, the first time that the hazardous cargoes have been the, um, the, the primary subject of, of the study. So let's, I, I just pushed, um, okay. All right, good. I can, I'm now in control of my screen. And um, uh, okay, challenge of hazardous cargoes. Obviously, elevated seriousness of hazardous cargo crashes. And second, prohibition of hazardous cargoes in important parts of the uh, of the roadway system. Uh, we will discuss each of these individually and the difficulty of developing hazardous cargo traffic data. Now, the, uh, all of these are, none of this should be too surprising, but the question is why are we doing this, this study? First of all, um, has this car, these are important commodities that have to move, but they also, they're challenging, they have to move safely. So they, they, they sort of deserve a little bit of extra attention. And we're gonna take these in sort of reverse order. One of the, and the it's difficult to get data Please bear with me to the end of the study, be, at the end of this uh, presentation, because you will get basically all the data that there is on, on uh, uh, hazardous cargoes in the uh, core area. Um, we just, I'm gonna get through some introductory, introductory material. First of all, the challenge of developing um, data, you don't know if it's a hazardous cargo unless you can actually see the, um, unless you can actually see the placard. So here, um, the, here we have uh, two examples. Three means it's a, um, uh, a liquid. Uh, 1203 means it's gasoline. You get my, my memorandum. There's a link to a database prepared by the EPA that has, decodes all the placards. But the, these are two of the most uh, common that you, that, you, that you see. Now, uh, and if you, if you don't see, if, if you look when two, if when other methods are used to count trucks like tubes and loops and collecting tolls, you just know it's a big truck. You don't know if it's got a hazardous cargo unless you actually see the placard. Okay, now how do can people? How do I get a laser point pointer? Uh, Matt, can you help me out? Uh, uh, you should have one. Do you not see it? No, are, are not. Um, I, I don't see what I click to get it. Can can people see my cursor? 
Oh, there it is. Okay, uh, but how do I, how do I move? Okay, I, okay, I, I am now moving it. And up here, you, you see, okay, you see the placard, this happens to say, that's, that's, it's stenciled on the back of a gasoline truck. Um, and the reason it is, is even when the truck, is, or once say empty, after it has delivered all its gasoline, there are still fumes in it and it is still, still hazardous. So once these things come from the factory with that, uh, uh, with the things stenciled on, they are not allowed to go in a tunnel ever, at least in the United States. Okay, then here we go. And this is a liquefied natural gas. Same thing, another uh, uh, stenciled on um, placard. Okay, now we have, those are semi-trailers, those are the large ones. And then we have another class of vehicles. Now, these are single unit uh, ones. And what I point out is uh, loops and, and tubes. We'll count this as a, doesn't know whether this is carrying gas, uh, uh, fuel oil or, or, or beer. You know, it's, it's just a, a big truck. When we go out there, we actually see the, the, um, the uh, placard stenciled on at the side. Now, this is the kind of a truck that would bring you home heating oil in the winter. Well, okay. You also see these things in summer uh, and you can sort of read here it says home heating oil. And here we see diesel fuel. What happens in the summer, the construction season picks up. You got a lot of heavy equipment out of construction sites they get refueled out on site. So if you see these trucks going around in the middle of summer, they are refueling construction vehicles out in the field. Now, we have another single unit truck here and here is its placard. It's got one down here and, and here it's got a green placard for some kind of a funny gas of, and, and here, here it has another placard. And uh, this, this is carrying uh, industrial chemicals, so, uh, some of these, or like you know, acetylene for welding. And uh, here, here you have like liquefied nat nat nitrogen going to hospitals. And now these placards can be opened and closed. So if the truck goes, delivers at its welding sites, it can go close up its placard and then it can continue to go to its next customer, maybe a hospital or something by, by, by any route. So, so you're out, out count traffic, this is what you see. Okay, and now roadways prohibiting hazardous cargo. Basically, it's any tunnel. So we'll 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 start out here. We have in the outer harbor. You have the Ted Williams Tunnel. No no hazardous cargos. Then here here we have Callahan going northbound, Sumner going southbound, and the inner harbor. No hazardous cargos. Hazardous cargos can also cannot go on the Tobin Bridge because they would have to go under the tunnel under City Square. So we move up here. If, if you're coming down Route 1, there, you get to Carter Street. There's a sign that says, uh, in, in Chelsea, there's a sign that says, uh, well, it says two things. It says, last, last exit before toll. And it also says, all hazard cargos must, must exit here. So um, because if you continue, you would be forced to go under, uh, under um, City Square. Now, similarly, you're coming down 993 and you, and you get through Somerville. At this point, you have a choice. You can get off to Sullivan Square or you can get off, it's not shown here on this schematic, the Leverett connector. You has cargos have to get off because if you keep going on 993, you will end up in crossing the Zakem Bridge and you will end up in this underground central artery. So you're forced to get off there. Similarly, out here in Alston, you're coming on I-90 you get to Alston, hazardous cargos have to get off because if they don't, they are, they're stuck going here until they, and they go underneath, they would have to go underneath the crew. So those, those paths, everything marked in red can have hazardous cargos. Now I also mark here in blue, something we know as critical urban freight quarters, something we've discussed uh, a, a number of times at, at, with the MPO, the MPO, and then later, uh, uh, MassDOT and Federal Highway approved this selection of roads as critical urban freight quarters. When these roads were chosen, 
for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons that these roads were identified as critical urban freight quarters was to serve as bypass routes to be able to, to you know, get around the, uh, the uh, uh, hazardous cargo prohibitions. Um, but hazardous cargo's jumping ahead. Not that many trucks, most of the trucks are, don't have hazardous cargo. So the, these are used by great variety of trucks, but, the, but the, one of the important things about them is avoiding um, going through tunnels. Now, here we have Route 99 is the only place where hazardous cargoes can cross, can cross the harbor. The Boston Harbor, this is the, you know, the Mystic River you're getting up here away from the port. And why can't uh, hazardous cargoes, you know, City Square is actually a very, very short, short tunnel. So the, at one time, like, back in the 1980s, the question came up, is there a tunnel short enough that you could let hazardous cargoes go in? And, and the Federal Highway um, actually looked at that. There was, a, there was a, a mine in West Virginia. They actually did some tests just to talk about, you know, fire suppression and stuff. But at the end of the day, the answer is no. And here's the reason. First of all, fires create a lot of hot, hot air, so the flame and the heat rise, and the firefighters can come in from the, from the side and squirt their foam or their fire suppression, whatever substance they're using for that particular type of fire, they can squirt it from the side and they can fight the fire as the flames and the heat rise. If you're in a tunnel, even a short tunnel, the heat and flames are coming out of the tunnel and you're asking the firemen to come in, the, the, you know, the, the firefighters to come in and enter the chimney to fight the fire. And that's, that's, just, that's just not acceptable. So uh, even, even, even Tobin Bridge, can't use Tobin Bridge. So, the, we, so we have to get these, uh, these important commodities around the city. And this is what their network, so this is what key parts of the network look. I've say, taken out everything in red uh, everything prohibited, prohibited. So you come down I-93, and at this point, you're out on city streets. You can use, um, actually, let me say, you can, trucks can go anywhere that they're not, that they're not prohibited. What I'm showing here in blue, uh, which is parts of the National Highway Freight, Net freight Network, which is the, the interstates, plus the critical urban freight quarters, and some intermodal connectors here and here. The, these are simply sections of the roadway that the freight program at the MPO has given a lot of attention to. So we actually have a lot of data around these. These, these, these are important. But so when a truck comes down here on, on I-93, I it has to get off and goes, it has to get off and go somewhere. And it, it may use a um, critical urban freight corridor. If it comes in on I-90, it's, it, it's got to get off here and it could, it could take any road. It might, it might take the critical urban freight quarter, same, you're coming up on I-83, you know, you, you know, you have to get off and, uh, uh, and take some road. You might actually sometimes be allowed to go on the Rose Kennedy Greenway, which we'll talk about in a, a, a second. Now, the, um, uh, what you're seeing today, when I jump your head, I'm gonna give you a lot of numbers. I told you, I've been looking at these, this region for a number of years and I've accumulated. And when I look at these roadways, even if I'm looking for Amazon delivery vans or whatever, I always count for hazardous cargoes because I know if, if I don't count and they won't get counted. So I've been collecting these counts for years. Today, we're bringing them all together to create sort of a complete picture. Some of these counts are several years old. People might reasonably ask, well, are they old? Are they? Are the counts aren't current? Are they any good? Well, actually, okay. One of the nice things about our our profession is things change, but things tend to change gradually. So, if if you have a hazardous count, cargo truck count from last year and from four years ago, uh, they're probably roughly count, uh, comparable. You can put them all on the same map. You you will get you you'll you'll get the you'll get the picture of it and. Uh, and in 
the re in the actual memorandum, anything I've counted uh, is going to be in the memorandum somewhere. But what you're actually going to see on, on, the, on, the, on a map is 20, 29 specific locations with the actual number. Um, now there's also on there's also on the map there were 13 minor lo roadways with few um, uh, hazardous cargo vehicles. We're, we're not shown on the map to avoid clutter. And then there's uh, the four locations not in the map area, like out in you know Newton Corner and uh, Stoneham. Uh, and then also not on the map are nighttime counts on Charles Sound Bridge. One of the things generally. A lot of my analysis is during daytime hours, so I can really look at these trucks and describe them. So six in the morning to six at night. However, there was an issue about uh, trucks going over the on the Rose Kennedy Greenway at night. People want to know how more, how many. I set my alarm a couple times, went out, actually counted them. You will see them today. But before we get ahead here, we just spoiler alert. Just uh, next, they're going to be on the next map, but. Uh, hazardous cargo are only significant if you're near the terminals. And here is a terminal on Route Route 1A up in Revere. And here is a semi-trailer getting, I think I saw it when it left, I think it's getting gasoline. It could be getting diesel fuel that will go out to, to some uh, gasoline station somewhere. And then over in um, Chelsea, there's a, another terminal. Uh, and here is a, a a single unit truck with home heating oil. And I don't, everybody, it's, I know it's no fun going out and they may be filling up your car self-service. Here's, here's the driver up there uh, loading his own, filling, filling his own uh, uh, truck. So that's, uh, anyway, so these are the terminals. This is where, okay, daytime. That's between six in the morning and six in the evening. These are the, uh, you know, they're the two-way, you know, the two-way volumes. Um, so counting the two directions at the same time here on Mar on on Marginal Street in in uh, in, uh, in Chelsea, I counted 175 on 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 the, on the two-way two ways combined. And uh, now this. The, we have numbers here that range from these dots of the terminals. Here, here was the one I showed you in, in, in Revere where they were uh, loading up the semis. Here's, here's another one in Revere. Here's one in East Boston. Here's another in Chelsea. And here's one in Chelsea. That, this is where the, uh, the driver was on top of his uh, truck loading with uh, uh, heating oil. And then we have a LNG terminal here, an Exxon terminal. So the big numbers you see are actually near the, the, the terminals. And then as, as, they leave, as they leave, they tend to, to dissipate as, as they, they spread out, uh, fanning out over the region to, to find, find, find their customers. And here's the Rose Kennedy Greenway. And during the daytime, these 56 trucks or probably using the, uh, the Rose Kennedy Greenway and they're allowed to go to a, a, a customer in Boston. The regulation of the Road, Rose Kennedy Greenway um, is discussed in, in, um, in detail in the memorandum. I won't go through it here. Um, but what I actually would like to uh, talk about is, is here, here we have some numbers I, like here, here I have a number zero, zero HC trucks, here's zero. And where here's here's a number zero, and oh here's here's a number on on Route Two at Alewife is six. Now the these the let's focus. You don't usually see a, a, a findings like this where somebody will actually put a zero onto on a traffic map. So how does this? Why? How did I come up with this number zero? Well. Here is the way I, I, I collect data, and these are this data I collect is tends to be for other other studies, but just I also count the hazardous cargos. There's a lot of trucks. Okay, trucks, they start early in the morning and they run straight through the middle of the day. So you have the morning rush hour, but you see a lot of trucks in the middle of the day. 
And then they, in the evening rush hour, trucks do a very sensible thing. They tend to go back to their motor pool and stop. That's a very, very smart thing to do during the evening rush hour. So to understand truck traffic, you really need to look at it all day. So I, I divide the day between six and nine in the morning, and then, and then nine and noon, noon and three, and three and six, four three hour periods. And then during each of those three hour periods, I will go out and count for like 90 minutes, either 90 minutes straight or 45 minutes and 45 minutes, something, something like that. So I will do that for each of the four nine, uh, three hour periods. So over the course of the day, I will accumulate about six hours of direct observation. So if I am at this intersection, uh, this is Summer Street at first, you know, Summer Street and First Street in South Boston. And I, I'm, I'm counting the, 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 the Summer Street court. If I count there for six hours and see no placarded trucks, uh, you know, two times zero is zero. So that's, that's how this, uh, who knows, one may have sn snuck in during the six hours I wasn't counting, but that's, that's where this number comes. We come up here, I checked at route two at both directions at ALI circle for, for six hours, found a total of three hazardous cargo trucks, two going one way and one going the other, three, that was for six hours, multiplied by, by two, that's why I got have that's why I show six six trucks here. So that's where these these numbers come from. So these are the simply the cardinal numbers. You that this is the first time they're being presented in in public. Uh, but the 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 study has a you know tells a story of a number of them. Um, but I want to point out a couple of the, the somebody people could ask. What, what is the percentage of hazardous cargoes in general traffic? And I want to, then, then it's a little more complicated because you need um, the number, of, you need these, the very difficult to get uh, uh, hazardous cargo counts. Plus you also, need the, you also need the total volumes, which we don't always have. But here you see 53 on the Southeast Expressway. And then we have 68 on Rutherford Ave up in Charlestown. We have 156 here crossing over on Route 99, uh, crossing over the Mystic River from Everett to, to Charlestown, the, the first place that they can cross legally over the harbor. Um, we have 80 up here uh, on US 1, right north of the Carter Street ramp where, where, where they're actually allowed. And then we have up, up in Stoneham, not shown on this map, I counted there were three, 352. And let's go on to the next, okay. so. The, these are those numbers I, ju I just showed you. There's up in Stoneham, that's, that's the, 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 you know, the biggest. Then we down, you know, crossing the Mystic River in Charlestown, first place you can cross the, uh, you, you cross the harbor. And then we have US-1 in Chelsea, right, right north of um, Carter Street, where, where they're allowed. And then we have Rutherford Avenue, that's actually pretty big. And then we have, uh, have I-93. Uh, so the, these are the ones, these are the five locations where I also had total traffic. Um, in the memorandum, you get a lot more numbers than I'm showing here. I'm boiling it down to sort of the key number. Boom, this is, this is a quotient. This is simply those, these numbers divided by total traffic give you the fraction of hazardous cargoes of, um, of total traffic. And these range widely. Down in, in, in South Boston, that I-93 down by, down by Southampton Street, uh, it's, it's like, that's a, like a 30th of a percent. I mean, it's 0.03% it's or it, that is very small percentage. And then you get up here, this is, this is the only way they can cross the, uh, the uh, uh, harbor at Route 99 in Charlestown is, you know, 0.58%, you know, much higher percent. So that is quite a range. And even then, that's the, that's the only place that has this car to go. It's still uh, you know, less than a percent of, 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 of traffic. So the, the uh, let, let's, let's talk the, yeah, quite a range. And, uh, and actually, let me just add, if, if you looked at trucks 
as a percentage of traffic, it would not, it would be like between, you know, 4% and 9% and it's, it'd be arranged, but nothing, nothing as wide as this. So the implications, okay. Hazardous cargoes represent a small fraction of both trucks and total traffic. Um, uh, re reflecting hazardous cargoes and travel demand, demand model is difficult. Uh, that's a whole other topic, but getting data, developing uh, trip generation, big challenge. And uh, ensuring safe hazardous cargo transportation is an important public, public policy issue, as I said at the first, first slide. Um, these are important commodities. They have to move. They have to move safely. And with that, thank you. Thank you for your attention. And uh, any questions? Thank you, Bill. Very informative. Questions from the members? Daniel Amstutz. Thank you. Um, thank you, Bill. That was really, really quite interesting. Um, I had a couple of questions come up. One of them was, um, I was sort of skimming through the memo a bit and I think I found most of the answer to the, well, I guess my first question. My first question, and I'll just ask them both. Um, first one is, um, so I was thinking about like where this hazardous cargo is coming from. And I think you've got a section in your memo about, you know, it comes from, or it's, I guess, delivered to, ports and by ship, you know, by, uh, by ship or by uh, plane, like to the airport. And I guess it's, it gets distributed from there. So I was curious if that's like, a, you know, generally the case or whether any of this comes from like overland, uh, you know, outside of the region and then comes into here or whether it's all typically by ship or, or plane. And then my second question is about the, um, parkways and you know usually many of the parkways are they're looking at route 16 which i guess is um i guess at this point isn't exactly part of the mystic valley parkway system but you know there's you know, buses and you know trucks or large trucks are prohibited from those those roadways too um because there's lots of low bridges and things and i wonder if that's an issue here i see you know i see like memorial drive or storo drive aren't listed as, as being no trucks. And I know, is that because those trucks are small enough to get through those bridges? Um, so those are my questions, thanks. Okay, um, fair enough. Okay, yes. Through, through much of the DCR system, uh, trucks with all cargoes are, are, are prohibited and I, I could have shown that as when I at the beginning when I showed the prohibitions that was that was only prohibition those were areas where the hazardous cargoes were prohibited but the other trucks were allowed and it, it would have been too 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 much too complicated to go into all the all those other issues so uh, but yes we're absolutely correct and let me let me take I. I think I've lost, have I lost my laser? Have I lost my laser pointer? Ah, there it is, thank you, thank you. Okay, because up here, oh, th thank you, it's nice to see somebody. Yeah, you're, you're from Arlington, here's, here's your town right there. And, and the trucks, uh, you know, general, any truck is allowed to go between Route 2 and Mass Ave. Then, 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 the, prohibition, then the prohibition kicks in. So that's, and I do mention in the tech, that's part of the reason why this number is so, so small. It is not just that you're a long way from, from, the, uh, from, the, from the terminal complex, it's also because the, the roads leading into this are, are not, tend not to be major truck routes in, you know, in general. But, um, but, but yes, what you said, what you said is, is absolutely true. So if, if you have a road like Storo Drive, or Memorial Drive that doesn't allow any trucks. It also does not allow the the hazardous cargoes. That that is that is true. And I can't wait till you can visit me at the office and we're going to lay some plots out on the table. We can really we can really look at, at these are very complex networks. I've just been trying to to you know hit the key high points. As as for here and the you you mentioned aircraft. No, don't worry. I mean if if aircraft. Is carrying a hazardous cargo. I mean, it's it's something 
maybe as a biohazard is, I mean, it's something small and high value. This terminal here, which generates trucks also is where aviation fuel come, aviation fuel comes in here into Chelsea Creek, ties up, and then there is a pipeline that, bring, that brings the jet fuel over here to the plane. So the, the, the harbor is the way to bring, has this, these liquid fuels into the city, in, into this urban area. And fortunately, aviation fuel doesn't have to be trucked into the airport, it, it, it's, it's brought in by pipe. But one of the problems of develop, uh, our model right now is a statewide model. And when you go to places inland, you, you remember just a few weeks ago, there was a, the um, uh, hackers, we believe from, um, uh, from, from Russia, uh, hacked into the, cl the colonial pipeline system, which comes up from the Gulf and it brings refined products up the East Coast. So you, the, it, so what, when, the tr when the tankers come into the Boston Harbor, they're actually, they're not, they're chemical carriers. It's already been refined and they bring it up here. And so Colonial Pipeline was bringing refined products and they would have a place, uh, I think there's one near Springfield or something. And it would be just like one of these terminals where, where the, the trucks go distribute out. Now, if I'm at the Boston MPO and you, the, the MPO members want to know about hazardous cargoes. They're mostly coming from, they're mostly originating here in the harbor because this is, this is the best way of getting these refined products into, into, the, re, into the region is here. If we were to, to try to bring hazardous cargoes into the model, the model's a statewide model, I'd have to go and, and sit out at, at the colonial terminal in, the, in Western Massachusetts and, and, and count trucks there. So it, it, would, it, would, it would add an additional dimension, which you know, might, might be interesting, but it'd be, it'd be very challenging. But right now for this region, uh, the port of Boston is, is, the, is, is the best way to bring, to, bring these thing, uh, to bring these things in. So does that, does that help you? Yes, definitely. Thank you very much. It's very informative. Okay, you're very welcome. Ken Miller. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you, Bill. Very, very informative. I, I just want to uh, seek some clarification on something. Uh, I just want to uh, make sure I understand that, or well, folks understand that, the prohibition of, of these hazardous materials in the tunnels is not a federal it's not a federal regulation or law, or not, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, not even a state regulation or law. It's, it's, it's really the determination of the Boston, Boston Fire Commissioner that prohibits these uh, hazardous cargoes in the tunnels. It's got uh, there. So, uh, uh, you know, we did do the research, as you mentioned, the, you know, the, the uh, abandoned uh, tunnel, and we, you know, Federal Highway did do research, set it on fire, and things like that. But uh, it is a, the determination of the Boston Fire Commission, not federal or state law or regulation that prohibits these vehicles in the tunnels. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. And I, I want to correct myself. In fact, just as soon as I said it, I, I realized I, I, I misspoke. So thank you. For, thank you for correcting me on, on, on that. And uh, yes, yes, it is. It is up to the local fire, fire, fire commission. Thank you. Derek Schuster. Thank you, David. Uh, I just have three quick things. One, Bill, excellent presentation. Uh, thank you. Uh, two, um, I know across Metro Boston, we're seeing an unprecedented amount of uh, lab science and lab tech type of facilities in the millions of square feet, not only concentrated in some of the traditional neighborhoods we've seen them, but really outside of the urban core. And I guess one of my questions is, is there any link with hazardous cargo vehicle trips to some of these facilities? And is that something we're tracking as those industries are growing? And then my last question was actually something that came up when Ken just spoke um, on whether or not the Office of Homeland Security um, or Department of Homeland Security 
has any bearing on hazardous uh, vehicles going into and out of the tunnels? Because I thought that the failure of imagination report after 9-11 kind of indicated highlighting areas where we need to be better prepared proactively against disasters. But more interested in the first side of this conversation. Okay, well, um, yeah, no, first of all, I don't know anything about the Homeland Security, but I, if, if it has to do with liquid fuels, the fire, the local fire marshals have helped us out on that. So we're, if, so we're okay with the liquid fuels. They won't be the problem. There could be, uh, there could be other types of explosives, but that's, that's, that was outside the scope of this study. Um, now, you mentioned hazardous, okay, bio waste. I actually rode my bicycle to this, this place in Somerville called Triumvirate, which deals with, with, with medical waste. And as I was watching the, these trucks, I would sometimes I would see a Triumvirate truck with a, with a placard, with a bio waste placard. And sometimes I would see it with a red dangerous placard as well. So I went up there and I actually talked with one of their, you know, one of their drivers. And the, what they told me is if they have a biohazard placard, they can still drive anywhere. I mean, not on a parkway. They can still go anywhere a truck can go, including in, in the tunnels. The perp, actually, I have a link in my report. You click, there's, a, there's thousands of different placards. And the purpose of most of the placards is to inform the first responders so they can look, so they, they, they show up, they know what to do. Only if it's the red placard does it, does it kick you out of the tunnel. So, so with, the, with the biohazard, they can still go in the tunnel. The placard, if something goes wrong, the placard will form a first responder as to, as to what's there. And, and then so they can, they can better take care of it. They, they triumvirate in their business, business they have customers or they pick stuff up. Sometimes it, it, they will have a truck that has a biohazard and a flammable liquid. And depending depending on the size, then they'll have to flip open their you know their their both the red placard can't go in the tunnel and and then they'll have their biohazard. Uh, yeah, it's and it was the same thing at the beginning. I had a the picture of the welding supply, and it and it had both. It had the two sets of placards that can carry liquid nitrogen to hospital, settling for welding torches. So the so with the biohazard is sort of the same type thing. It is hazardous, but it doesn't fall into the sort of the class of problems that I that I dealt with on this particular on the, this particular study. Thank you, Bill. Lynn Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, just a couple of quick questions, Bill. So um, uh, who, what was the origin of the study? This wasn't a UPWP study, was it? No, this is the, the, um, the freight program has, it, it's since about 2014, there, there's sort of sort of funding each year. And with that funding, uh, the freight program staff always comes up with try to some some major study. And in, in addition to serving on working groups, we try to do some field pull in and and shine a spotlight on some particular issue. Uh, for the first couple of years, we actually had to uh, do a scope beforehand, since it's a program that that requirement has 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 been waived. But there's still uh, you know always the intent to within within the funding. Of the freight program, in addition to going to meet, you know, serving in working groups to be able to uh, pull something together. And uh, fortunately, with this, it was um, uh, organizing a lot of data I already had. Plus, I went out and got some ad some additional uh, from ad additional data. But if if um, think of it, want, want to put if you want to put something large in the UPWP. Uh, we're ready to go. <laughs> okay. Well, well, just maybe, just maybe a couple, couple of questions. So, so, um, any any data on AC accidents? Uh, no. Um, okay, that's good. That's good. No, it's fine. No, it's a fine answer. You know, so I'll take that. Um, uh, so, um, any, do you think it'd be worth studying? I mean, um, high um, hazardous hazardous cargo routes I mean in EJ communities. Because I mean, I find it interesting because like you know, there's not a lot in the parkways, 
you know, and, and yes, I mean, I mean, they are going to go into like the dense urban areas because, well, that's where a lot of, I mean, where you get a lot of stuff, you know, but the routes they take, I mean, um, could potentially be different. It's certainly the development that we do along those routes could be different. I mean, so do you think it's something worth looking into as a UPWP study? Um, well, first of all, the, 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 the semi-trailers tend to go to gasoline stations and gasoline stations uh, tend to be major arterials because that's where, you know, I mean, they're, they're, if they're not on a major arterial, they, they won't be able to stay, stay, stay in business. Um, so you, you, you could ask, are, are, the, are the major arterials themselves because they, they have traffic, they have regular trucks, and of course, they have the trucks that are that are bringing bringing liquid fuels to their to their uh, to the service stations. Uh, so I would to follow. That would be one line of analysis to to look at the designation of major arterials um, and the environmental justice implications of that. A home heating oil for the 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 single unit trucks. They only go into a neighborhood. I mean, if there's, if, you know, if there's custom, if there's, if there's fuel, fuel customer, um, part of the, re, if if you if you have a neighborhood, and let's say you have a street and ten people to get home heating oil, and half the half the households get from one vendor, and half five of the households purchase from one vendor. And five of the households purchase from a different vendor, then then you might have more trucks. If if they all agreed to go to the same vendor, you'd have fewer trucks. But don't that, then you get in the question: Do people have a? Uh, you you could say the same thing. If, if everybody should should only buy from Amazon and, and not not get trips from you not get stuff from UPS, and then you would reduce the number of of trucks. So the 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 fact that people get deliveries from the vendor of their choice is, is one of the things which, which causes this. So uh, one, in, in a limited area, one might be able to, to measure this and then, but to, to the, the, the an environmental justice angle, um, it, it's not clear exactly what it, what it would be. It could be placed in context of some of these things, but these are some of the, some of the dynamics of why, of, you know, why these trucks are in certain places. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. So I was really just asking me as opposed to making a statement and just trying to understand the extent to which research might be warranted or worthwhile. Um, and so finally, you know, you said that you weren't making any recommendations, I mean, um, formally in the in the in the report. But but if there are any that you want to share, you know, I'm, I'm all ears, me either here or anywhere else. So thank you. That's great. OK, well, Mike, do, well, let me ask what is. Is the advisory council going to be interested in this uh, talk? Yes, yes, we you know, very much so because we, you, you, uh, yeah, yeah. So, okay, I hear you. Let's we'll have you back. Looking forward to it. Excellent, thank you. Andy, you got something you want to say? Yeah, I just wanted to respond to Len's uh, question briefly uh, about study ideas moving forward and say, both in my capacity as the outgoing uh, UPWP manager and my capacity as the incoming uh, freight program manager that I'd be happy to talk over and this or any other study ideas and how we can uh, fund it and, and pursue that either as a, a discrete UPWP study or as an activity of the freight program. Thanks, Andy. Thank you, Bill. Very informative. Okay. Next item on the agenda is member items. Are there any? Seeing none, can I get a motion and a second to adjourn from a member and please state your name for the record? Eric Barasa. I will make a uh, motion to adjourn, Mr. Chair. Lynn Diggins. Lynn Diggins seconding that motion. Uh, without objection, we are adjourned. I believe we're going to cancel the January 6th meeting, but don't cancel it till you get the official notification from staff, please. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.